So because ill prepared, we have one of Japan's finest juice box sakes, uh, onigoroshi, <laughs> which literally means demon killer. Oh God! This is one of the only things that they sold in the Seven Eleven and the are the depart the convenience store in the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. So I was on the night shift. It was like, well, you didn't pack anything. You had a choice of one couple of zeki, or maybe onigoroshi, or maybe some of that like umeshu over there. Sometimes we'd stock the. Does it have like an actual ume in it? Yeah, it does. That's that's a sign of super quality. So. Plum blossom, not plum blossom, um, Japanese plums. Uh, yeah, I probably need some ice for that. No, we probably need ice for a lot of this. All right, I, I guess, you know, you, you do the intro or? Intro? Intro? <laughs> what, are, what are you talking about, Jake? So we are here in Tokyo. Would you like to try some Japanese foods? I'll trade, sure. Would you like some bourbon? Alright. So we have a whole audience here tonight in Tokyo. First and foremost, I keep my promises. Oh! Thank you very much. Lovely. Nice pair of socks. I said on Twitter I was going to get Jake a pair of matching socks. I did so. It's good, actually. I actually, I actually have many matching socks these days, but it's always nice to have one. For you, we're going to give you Onigoroshi. Um, one of the finest 100 yen sakes you can find in this country. <laughs> um, so at a current exchange rate, that is roughly 77 cents? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and puncture this juice thing. I'm not even drunk, actually, and I'm still having trouble doing that because I don't have my glasses on. Here you are, sir. Why, thank you. And uh, I will teach you. You probably already know the Japanese way to say cheers. Kampai. Yeah. Kampai. Did you know that the homonym for kampai actually means total defeat? It's Different kanji, but same thing. Come by. Come by. Cheers. Jake, thank you for doing the show, by the way. I, uh, how could I, how could I, res how could I say no to share you? Yeah, I actually wanted to start <laughs> off with how this came about. Go, dozo, dozo, dozo. Um, <laughs> uh, I can't pronounce her name correctly, so I'm sorry. Sherry, who's one of the finest uh, icons of MILF porn in, in, you know, in the modern adult entertainment industry, um, uh, wrote to me and she said, hey, my friend Matt Slayer is coming to Tokyo. Would you, would you be doing a podcast for him? And I said, I would be delighted. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a fan of her work and, uh, you know, and it seemed so, so kind of wacky and out of, out of left field. Um, I was like, yeah, sure, I'd love to do it. Um, it weirdly enough, like uh, at the Daily Beast, Aurora Snow, who is just a delightful human being, who used to be a porn star, like moved to my hometown. So we've been writing for the Daily Beast for years and she moved to Columbia, Missouri. So uh, she's also a good friend. And I don't think I've ever formally interviewed her, but over time, um, you know, got to learn a lot more about the adult in entertainment industry. And then I listened to your show, which was uh, hilarious. Your, your interview with Ms. Allure was just like really, really funny. She's really funny. Um, and she sounds like she's a good cook too. Um, and so, I'm looking forward to trying that one of these days, maybe. So I thought, you know, and you were very, you were very, uh, very polite, and you were like, I can adjust your schedule, and I'm like, I, you know, I can't give you two hours, but I can definitely give you an hour. And thanks for waiting, because um, over here is Shoko and Amy. We've all been working on this podcast about m missing people called The Evaporated, and while we're doing this uh, podcast with you, I, I assume the, the the booze we have in here will all evaporate. These things happen on this show. It's been known to happen. It's A-OK. -okay. I brought the bourbon to share. I wasn't planning to kill a whole bottle. Like, hi, Jake. This is the first time meeting me. I'm going to kill a whole bottle of bourbon in front of you. No, I, uh, after this, I have some, um, I have some concub concubina duties to fulfill, so I can't get too drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're going to, Jake, we're going to make it weird off the bat. What kind of whiskey dick do you get? Oh, do you know what whiskey dick in Japanese is? Would, would anyone like to, I, I'm sure you know the word, right? It's, yeah, it's funya ching. So funya <laughs> means like, like weak yeah, and limp. Yeah, funya, funya, funya. So funya ching. So I don't know, you know, actually I don't really drink whiskey that much, so I don't think I've, I've really. Well, I think that applies to all booze enabled, oh, oh. flaccid, or in my case, I don't finish. 
Oh, so you have what is called retarded ejaculation. So you have a retarded ejaculation problem when you when you have too much booze. Yes. Uh, I didn't know we could call it that in 2022, but... That is the technical word, unless they've updated the word to make it more politically correct. There's premature and there's retarded. So in, in that context of, of uh, erectile dysfunction disorders, um, it, it gets kind of a disorder, right? Because it's... Well, never mind. I'm not, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> but I believe the term is still retarded. Uh, I will take your word for it. You were much more educated than I. No, I just lose interest. You know, I'm just, I just fall asleep. I'm a terrible drunk. <laughs> just make the missus do the work. It's fine. Pull, pull a JFK. No, I'm like, I'm like, call me when I'm, call me when I'm sober. <laughs> I promise that I will not ruin you for the missus tonight. Thank you. I oh, appreciate it. Though if you do it to yourself, I'm not going to stop you. Taking it and pace it. No, just a, a little bit of, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, yeah, try the bourbon at least. I will try the bourbon. Is that I, it, isn't this? A, didn't I pour like umeshu into my stuff? Or is that the bourbon? I don't think the umeshu is brown. It's actually quite close. Oh my <laughs> god, that stuff is the harsh. <laughs> Much of a bourbon drinker. Wow. It's very nice. It's ninety four proof. It's fine. Jesus. I'm gonna go have my 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 pussy umeshu. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the, the more slightly serious topics I wanted to like pick your brain about was, you know, I interview a lot of sex workers in the U.S. and just the differences between U.S. sex work, Japanese sex work, since I, I know that is your realm. Oh, I mean, it used to be my realm because I, I mean, I don't report on it as much, but I mean, the biggest difference is that, it, that Japan has a substantially legal sex industry. So... Um, Except for zoning, I mean, except for zoning law. So it basically works like this: any sexual service that you would that you can provide that, that can be offered by men and women is legal. So um, you know everything that from frottage, from anal sex to uh, to a blowjob to cunnilingus to uh, um, what is that thing? What's what's it? Um, opaizuri? Like I guess that's frottage when you when you. A pearl necklace or whatever that stuff is. Okay. Um, all of that is com completely legal. Can be advertised and can be bartered and sold. The only thing that is technically illegal is is vaginal penetration. Um, and there are places called Soapland in Japan, which, uh, when they were changing the laws in Japan to sort of get rid of the overt sexual industry, they said we're not going to give any more license to this to for for Soaplands, which are basically places. A prostitution, but the rationale for so planned is this: you're going to, you're paying money to take a bath. So a, a woman or a man um, will bathe you, um, and you know pleasure you all within the legal limits. But if you go into the next room and you decide that you've fallen in love, then that is free love, G U I, and you just just have decided to have sex there. That's legal. Because the actual sexual intercourse is not included in the price of the bath, so you're paying like thirty thousand yen to be, to, you know, to be luxuriously bathed. Usually, traditionally, the woman or the man was a human sponge, um, and then you go into the next room, and should you instantly fall in love, which apparently happens quite often in these places, you know, who would have um, thought? Then that's legal in that context. So that's that's how the sex industry works here. So sex worker sex work is legal, but of course, because Japan is like many many societies hypocritical, they are also often discriminated against. When um, the Japanese government was handing out a very small amount of money during the COVID crisis for people who were losing income, they excluded people who were working in what they called the night village. So people working in the sex industry, some hosts, some hostesses, they weren't allowed to have any government funds or support because. Good, no reason was given. It was just a very arbitrary, like, fuck you to the sex workers. Same in the States. Absolutely same in the States. The SBA cannot hand out loans if you're in adult entertainment at all, even though strip clubs are perfectly legal. So a lot of adult performers made LLCs that you know were production companies and got their money that way, but they couldn't actually tell the government what they do for a living. Yeah, Japan is, is very weird about it. Um, um, I mean, and, you know, you can see, uh, like, you know, this this magazine here, 
which no one believes me. I just get for the articles about the Yakuza because all the Yakuza fan magazines went out of business. So the only places that are still doing like, you know, updates and what's happening in the Yakuza world, the weekly magazine style, are these, are these magazines like this, which of course are mostly, um, mostly sort of sex stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, well, so as, as time goes on, one of these things, one of the trends in these magazines is there's a lot of uh, centerfolds of like what are called mature, mature women, jukujo. I just think as Japan is aging, um, you just have a tendency for, I mean, I guess, you know, I guess it's actually a good thing that many Japanese men are more attracted, even younger men, to older women than they are to younger women, which isn't sort of the stereotype of that, but it exists. So that's, that's well, quite I mean, a niche market. I think that's been happening in the States, too. Milk porn is so big. Well, senior porn in Japan is a huge industry. Like full-on seniors? Yeah, like people in their 80s, 70s. I mean, it's it's senior porn is probably one of the biggest growing industries in Japan. I mean, it's kind of inter it's kind of interesting that it happens, but it's there. Anyway, um, you know, these magazines not only do they have stuff about the yakuza, but they also have reviews of sex clubs and what services are available and how they were. Um, you know, because because it's none of it's illegal, which is coming from puritanical America. That's pretty wild. Yeah, but you know, J Japan is kind of like. Uh, you know, while it's out in the open, it's also something you're supposed to be ashamed of. But it, this is also a country where, you know, well, you know, up to a couple of years ago, it was really possible for a porn star to go like mainstream entertainer. Uh, maybe not as possible as it is, as is um, now as it was then. So does that answer your question? The, the difference between sex work in Japan and the United States is sex work here is mostly legal. Um, you can get in trouble if you... If you um, Solicit on the street. That is that can get you interested. But the the prostitution laws in Japan, which are called the Boshi the Baishin Boshi Hole, stipulate that it is illegal to sell sex, which is defined as vaginal penetration. Um, but there is no punishment for the woman, and there's no punish for the, punishment for the man. The only punishment can be for who would for someone who serves as a pimp or if it's a brothel and it's a brothel owner. And those laws were designed to actually protect women who sort of been sold into slavery by their families at the end of the Second World War, so that, you know, so that if you felt sorry for this woman, you could go to the police and say, like, this woman here is like, you know, being forced to do sex work. And the police would take your statement, nothing would happen to you, and um, the pimp would get arrested and the woman would go free. So Japan's, you know, anti-prostitution laws are actually Japan's first anti-human trafficking laws. Where does pornography fit into that? I may have just killed Jake. I'm so sorry. No, no. Okay, so I'm not giving you CPR, Jake. We just met. So pornography in Japan, um, there's something called the Aiden Kai. So there's like this, you know, there's this whole association that, you know, because yes, you can go pay and get a blowjob or, or you know, or, or have sex at it, or have sex delivered to your house. But God forbid you actually watch unpixelated porn as it is, so that there's this whole giant industry and association, I think it's the Adrian Kyokai, that goes over every video and like determines like, you know, is it properly fuzzed out? You know, is it, uh, you know, is it pixelated enough to be acceptable? And, it, and of course, because it's the modern internet, you know, there's always now like, you know, there's the, the released version of the porn and then there's often like an unfiltered, uncensored version that sort of leaks out somewhere. Or ends up on the hub. Or ends up, yeah. The, the hub for viewers who don't know. Do you know what the hub is? Of course they know the hub. God damn, like, <laughs> you kids today. <laughs> I didn't know what the hub was. I thought the hub was like referring to the that, that really shitty bar in Rapongi where they serve <laughs> chips. You know, there's like a, there's like a hundred of those. <laughs> no, there's like, there's like hoodies. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Pornhub has definitely has merch. Yeah. Mind Geek has uh, done very well with branding. Yeah. Though I'm sure they'd like to forget at this point that they had Kanye host the very first awards <laughs> and make custom Kanye merch for it. And back in the back in the middle of like the whole internet like Bitcoin craze, there was somebody who came up with Vice tokens, which would tokenize like adult viewing, and it was it seemed like a great plan. I wrote an article about that, but I don't think it ever came to anything. 
I'm sure it was an ICO that made some money for someone and then... Yes, yes, an initial coin offering, yes. It was an ICO, Vice Tokens. It sounded like a great idea to me. Like you would have, people would get paid Vice Tokens to watch porn, which they could cash in and pay for porn. It was like, it, it was a kind of a Ponzi scheme, but it sounded kind Wait, of... an ICO that was a Ponzi scheme? No, 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 they don't, never, no. Yeah, there have been many actually. Back, Jake, back, I, in, I, back I, in the days when I reported on that stuff. I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. There's immoral people in cryptocurrency? No. Yeah, yes. You need to get your head out of the uh, out of that. You know those X-rated videos and like, you know read the news because you would be surprised. I'm illiterate. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to read the news? I need someone to read it to me. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I think what is the name of it? You know the place like DM is like the biggest porn company here, right? Like they had like DM Coin or something. I can't remember the name. You've never seen the ads? Okay. There's a company here. I forget. The, the, it's one of the biggest companies in Japan that people don't know about called DM or something. And they make like virtual 3D porn. Like, you know, well, you know, with you need 3D goggles and everything. Yeah, the, the and, and, and porn that everyone hates to make. And then they, and they bring in like a million dollars a month on that stuff because people will still pay. Um, so it's a huge industry here. And, uh, but does it fall under separate laws from prostitution? It, yeah, because it's, it's performance, right? It's performance, so therefore it's not well, sex work. But that, that's the wild part about the states is everywhere but California and New Hampshire, porn is technically illegal because it does fall under prostitution. Oh, I didn't know that. Wait, so the major porn industries are California and California. New Hampshire? New Hampshire doesn't, it, so New Hampshire <laughs> legally, no one, no one shoots in New Hampshire. No one shoots there. Why? But they put, wow, 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 wow. I see a business well, opportunity. Well, it's, well, it's, well, it's <laughs> it works. Why is nobody, it's picturesque. It's a live free and dice live. Yeah, <laughs> so California, California is legal to make pornography from a 1981 state Supreme Court ruling. Okay. New Hampshire actually voted it on the books. Because <laughs> what else are you going to do in New Hampshire? <laughs> I, booze on, I booze on Sundays when you live in Massachusetts. They have no taxes, so yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. We love New Hampshire. But, so because of that, okay. people technically fall under pandering when you're a porn producer in any other state in the nation. It's rarely enforced. Every once in a blue moon, like Central Florida, someone will come down on somebody. <laughs> like Nevada has basically said, because of California State Supreme Court ruling, we're effectively legalizing porn. But for a long time, the it, we're a lot of the industries in Vegas now, they just kind of look the other way. So it's not very common to come down on porn. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. That, that, no, they really come down hard on some porn. <laughs> 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 so what happens if stuff is released that isn't pixelated here? Uh, you can get arrested. Um, when I was covering Kabuki Show in from 1999 to 2001, you know, there was with, with great fanfare. They would announce like, you know, we raided a place today and seized, you know, 1,000 unpixelated porno videos and this money is probably going to organized crime, which it probably was. But, uh, you know, it, it was kind of like what the Vice Squad, you know, did half the time was like they, they'd find some place that was selling, um, you know, uh, uh, unpixelated porn and, and, and bust them. But it's like, in, you know, in this day and age, who is going to go out and buy a DVD? Even I don't buy that many DVDs anymore. That many. Keyword, that many. It's not like, not like adult movies, but like, a, yeah, I still like DVDs. Do they they're cheap. films and DVDs now? They do, they do, but like the new ones are mostly like straight to straight to video streaming shit. No, I'm not porn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a source of revenue for them anymore. So was porn a source of revenue for yeah. them? I mean, because people would pay huge amounts of money, especially if it was like you know a well known, well liked porn actress, and someone had like the you know the uncut copies. You could charge a hundred dollars for that, you know, and if, you know if you a hundred people buy it at a hundred dollars, and your net costs aren't that very much, that's a, that's a pretty decent profit. So, question, was there ever a point where the Yakuza was using pornography to circumvent, like, full-on prostitution laws? No, no. You don't need to circumvent prostitution laws. Well, I mean, but vaginal penetration. If you, the minute you had a camera involved, it's pornography, it's no longer, that guy's a oh, producer. Oh, 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 no. No, there was never, like, like, hey, you know, like, you, you know, like, hey, pay money to be in this, you know, 
porn production and then you can sleep with the woman. It was, it, it's always been, you know, understood that you know, what happens in a closed room uh, is probably going to actually be penetration. But the, you know, the, the storefront operations that were basically operating as sexual massage parlors were actually pretty good in making sure that it, you know, it didn't happen. If you were a woman working at one of those places, they would fire you if you started having actual intercourse with your customer because that's breaking the wall. Um, but as the years have gone by and they sort of closed down the storefront operations and everything moves to what is called a delivery health model. Daddy Heru. You've never heard that word? Daddy Heru? So, delivery Heru. Do you think that making it into Kotakon is going to be more recognized? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, people say Daddy Heru. And so, Heru is like any kind of, you know, like supposed to be massage or services, but and delivery is, you know, so you put them together, daddy heru, so that is legal. But you know, if, if once a, once the daddy heru woman goes to the you know, customer's hotel room, I mean, really, do you think that that's just going to stop at like a sexual massage? Probably not. Um, but there's no there's no way to check. And every now and then, you know, they they sort of I guess someone must go undercover or someone rats them out, um, and then they make an arrest. Um, I think there was one time uh, this police came officer, you know, it, it, police sometimes when you're coming to police, police, like they want their stories to be featured. But some of the stories are so disgusting, are, are so bizarre that, you know, even though it's technically a scoop in the sense like, nev you know, this law has never been used to, you know, to put these people in jail, um, you can't use it. So I think there was like one where they busted this like uh, sort of like sex club. Uh, and it was really just sort of a place like a, a happening bar where people went and, you know, they had, you know, they had sex, like kind of a sex swap thing, like not money involved. Maybe they paid an entrance fee, but not prostitution. But because they didn't um, keep the couples like separate from each other and you could see what other couples were doing, they busted everyone for public indecency. And they were so proud of themselves, like, you know, <laughs> sex club busted for Kozen Waisetsu, which is public indecency. But the one I remember the most that was the stupidest, but also highly revolting, but kind of funny, um, was there was this club in Kabukicho called Child. And in Child, all the, all the sex workers were lactating. So it was one of those places like Akachan play, like guys would get dressed up as like, I'm mean, going to put in diapers and, you know, suck, you know, suck breast milk out of the woman, right? That's part of the whole play thing there. Um, but... You know, and, and, and obviously it's not easy to produce breast milk all the time. I'm not a woman, so I don't know, but I have heard this. Um, and so they would have breast pumps, and sometimes they would, like, store the breast milk in bottles. But there are strict regulations about how you have to do that. So they busted this club for vanitation, for violation of Japan's sanitary laws. And they were like, you know, Tokyo police, first time ever have used this, you know, this, uh, you know, these sanitary laws to bust a sex club. And uh, you know, the cop who was on it was very proud of himself. He's like, this is a great scoop. It's never been done. And, and Japanese newspapers love that thing, like Zenkoku Hajimite, Zenkoku Hatsu, the first time this has been done, whenever some law is applied for the first time. It's kind of like a new and innovative. So I was like, OK, I'm going to write this up. And so I wrote it up, and I gave it to my boss. And he was like, and he, and he didn't say anything. He just printed it out. And he brought it to me. And then he hit me over the head with it. And he's like, he's like, he's like are, you, are you fucking kidding? This is a family newspaper. We can't put this shit in here. He's like, what, what do you think? We are Tokyo Sports? Like, no, no, no. I don't think. Bam, 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 bam. And then he ripped it up and he threw it in the trash. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. One of my greatest scoops. It was never printed. <laughs> well, thank you for telling my audience about it now. That is re goddamn ridiculous. Like, did the place eventually reopen? Uh, I'm sure it reopened. It's a, it's a very minor crime. I don't think anybody went to jail. I mean, I think they, I think they arrested him, held him for a couple of days. They confessed, yes, we did not properly store the, the breast milk, and from now on we will. And <laughs> yes. Where do you think your life would have been if you were known as Jake Adelstein, the guy who wrote the breast milk? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be living large <laughs> as the as the president of one of Japan's <laughs> finest adult video <laughs> makers. I feel like it, someone just realized this is a man who has an eye for talent. <laughs> <laughs> if you were known as Jake Adelstein, what would you have been? 
you made like a sensationalized headline in English, what would you call that scoop? Oh wow! <laughs> oh, you know, like, your yours is the best one. Um, um, uh, um, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so much post production work. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> um, busty breast milk bar gets a busty. Breast <laughs> 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 Obviously, you need more bourbon. <laughs> um, <laughs> di diaper dickheads busted in breast milk crack town. <laughs> <laughs> I have some bourbon, by the way. Absolutely. I feel like I need to drink more for this. Is that my cup of ice? That or no. you can just put it in. There. Perfect. <laughs> oh man. One of the other, one of the other, why not another subject? This is another one of my Mavoroshino scoops. So. In Japan, these kind of like swingers bars are called happening bars because something's always happening. So I got word through one, you know, one of my cop sources. Again, this guy was always giving me like stories that could never be turned into successful scoops, but A for effort. We're going to bust this happening bar and it's going to be a big story because there's a famous wrestler who's going to be there. And I'm like, and I'm like, and I don't know anything about wrestling. And I'm so, so who is the wrestler? And why are you going to bust him? And he says, well, because he's giving a, a sex seminar where he's actually going to have sex with the customers. Just public indecency. And I'm so, well, so what's the wrestler's name? And they say, his name is Choco Ball Mukai. And I'm like, Choco Ball? Because like, there are these little chocolate balls. Have you ever had them? They're like, like peanuts or something in them, and, you know, and... And when he was a wrestler, he became a porn star. But apparently his testicles, and as I was later at the scene when they arrested him, are actually very brown, like a chocolate ball, which is where he got his name, Choco Ball Makai. So <laughs> I went there. I had my article ready to go in, and um, the police busted him. And in like something like out of this novel called The Painted Bird, which I read once, like he, he was like when the cops busted him, he was so scared that he could not dislodge himself from the from the woman he was like humping doggy style. Like, I mean, he could, they like, I mean, like literally, they had like call in like paramedics <laughs> to do something to separate the two. It was the weirdest fucking thing. And so I wrote it up and and, and once again, my, my boss was like, it's like, no, I don't see no. I'm like, even though he's famous, no, this is just not for our, for our paper. And then the next day, Tokyo Sports, was like their top headline, Chocobo Mukai, busted the hopping bar. And look at this, look at this. I'm like, look at this, like that could have been our scoop. I gotta say, <laughs> that guy is an MVP of male talent. The fact that he could keep it up as the police are raiding the place. No, not only, did he, I mean, I, I think he locked, he locked in place. Yeah, but most people when they fail, just whoop. Um, I, you know, I heard, I, I you know, uh, sometimes supposedly this happens with animals, like dogs, like like they panic and they have trouble separating them. But I didn't know what could happen with human beings. It was really weird. I mean, that, all my years I've never seen that one, but I I don't think I've ever seen anyone really be panicked or yeah, no no full on arrests during sexual intercourse that I can remember. Okay, that's that's those are the the, the great classics uh, scoops I could have had if my newspaper just had a little bit. A little bit more courage and a little less taste. Actually, a lot less taste. Um. Well, just think, in the internet era, you could be writing a blog about it. Well, it, I mean, you have to wonder, what is the point of busting people for, you know, for uncensored pornography in an age where it's so readily available? I mean, even in Japan, they can't censor it out. They can't filter it out. Yeah, there's no any website, uh, any, any of numerous websites, and you can get unfiltered Japanese porn if you feel like... You know, you, you want to see both the genitals and the octopus, you know. Well, why are the antiquated laws still on the books? Why? Because uh, if you remove them, a lot of cops have nothing to do. I mean, it's just status quo. Uh, someone once said to me that in Japan, there's only th things are, if you, things are only done one of two ways. It's always been done that way or it's never been done that way. And since it's always been done that way and it's always been unacceptable, 
um, then they won't change the laws. Um, there was this weird period of time when I started on the job when they were talking about hair noodle. And hair is like hair. So uh, some photographer published a photo of like Mia Zalarie, uh, this really famous actress, and she was completely nude, except you know she had hair covering up her genitalia so you couldn't see the naked genitalia, and, and that was considered okay, as long as there's some hair covering it up so you can't see too much. I mean, that, that that's, was acceptable. That's the classic Playboy move. Really? Look at Playboys, even in the 90s, you never saw like an actual vagina, you saw the fuzz. I just thought that was the fashion at the time. No. Uh, that was to keep it in a men's magazine, a gentleman's magazine. See, so yeah, I learned everything. I'm, I'm so glad I was on this pod show. I just thought it was like, you know, just that hairy thing was the, the, the thing at the time. Because well, the U.S. struggles with its own puritanical bullshit. It does. But as you, as you can see from here, I'll pass this over to you, you can see that it's pretty hairy. Yeah, well, that is uh, pretty hairy. <laughs> it is indeed. Well, and, the, and the Bush is definitely making a comeback in the States, too, so. Really? Yeah. That would, uh, you know, the, I mean, because I, I wasn't out of, the, I was out of the States for many, many years, right? So I was living in Japan. So the first time, um, I know that my daughter's never going to listen to this, so it's okay, it's fine. Um, the first time I, like, I saw someone with, like, a complete Brazilian, I was just like, like, what? I was like, what, what the fuck? Like what, 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 like, what, what is this? And they're like, oh, it's like everybody in LA does this. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, it's like, you don't, don't you like it? And I'm like, uh, it's like, like, I mean, you look like a child. Like, I don't want to have sex with a child. It's really weird. But apparently, you know, that's, was a thing in the States. So, I mean, here, I think a little bit of hair is considered normal and none at all is considered abnormal. I mean, you can, like all things, you can get used to it. But the first time... Someone who lived abroad for a long time is like, wait, wow, that's really a little much. I mean, it's like a porn movie kind of thing. Well, and hoping that the wife never listens to this. Can you lead it? Ex-wife. Oh, ex-wife. Okay. Can we? Can you lead us into the story of how you encountered said vagina? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. Cause she's a really good friend. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <Is> she ashamed? <laughs> you don't have to tell us who it was. No, 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 no I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna tell. Um, uh. All I can say is a really good friend, and, you know, weirdly enough, like, you know, when, when I was in college, we ran into each other in, in, uh, at, a, at a Mr. Donuts here in Tokyo, and we stayed in touch. And then, you know, years go by, and one thing's lead to another, and, and you know, that's, was in, I think it was in Las Vegas. I was surprised. And obviously what happened in Vegas didn't stay in Vegas. No, no, because, you know, the relationship continued for a while. <laughs> I mean, I mean, nothing stays in Vegas, right? I mean, the only thing that stays in Vegas is, you know, the people who screw up and are buried somewhere. That's about it. And they keep finding them in Lake Mead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As it dries out? <laughs> yeah. They just keep finding bodies. <laughs> it's like the past, like emerging like a ghost. Yeah. I mean, why spend the effort to actually bury someone when you can just tie weights to them and throw them in the lake? I heard this really gross story about the about how about how actually most bodies, if you even if you tie weights to them and you throw them out of the river, they will float up. The, the ability of the human body to fill up with air and gas as it putrefies is amazing. It was, just, it was for this podcast, I read this book called The Corpse Knows. And he was talking on and on and like, you know, sort of like this chapter about like, yeah, bodies float up, man. You can weigh them down, they'll float up. And he said, he said, I could tell you exactly how much weight you have to use to keep a body from floating up, but I'm not going to. And I was like, oh, come on. That's such a tease, Dr. Wayne. Oh, come on. Well, I, I could tell you, but I'm not. Oh, come on. I, I would like to know. Right? Right? I, I was always told that you had to dismember them, and that helps with not floating up. Uh... You know, that reminds me of the famous Inogashira Cohen thing where somebody like diced up a body and put it in little white plastic bags and threw them in this this like park where they floated up next to the swan boats. And I don't think they ever really identified the body. That was like 1993 or something. I think that's one of the most famous unsolved dismembering corpse cases here. That's a very common way to dispose of a corpse here because it's not easy to find places to bury people. Like mm. the narrow land space. 
Yeah, not a lot of green space, and I'm sure someone would notice if you're in one of Tokyo's like tiny parks digging up a hole. I have been told also that it's very hard to, to bury a body in the mountains because the ground is very hard. Bury them deep enough that an animal won't um, dig them up. So, you know, separating and burning is probably the preferred way to do it. Is that how the Yakuza normally does it? or? Um, I think that the most successful serial killers were that I know of, Sekin again and his wife, Hiroko, um, they would uh, poison their victims, um, usually by giving them like a sports drink, like a stamina drink, and then they would take the bodies and um, cleave off the meat and feed it to the, to the animals in their pet shops. Then they would pulverize the bones and burn them, and they were pretty successful. But, um, but occasionally they would make a mistake, like forgetting to like leave a lighter behind or a piece of tooth or something. Um, but yeah, that seems to be the most ex the easiest way to do it. Is you have to separate the meat from the bones, then pulverize the bones, and then burn everything. And it's pretty hard to find the body once you do that. Um, Om Shinriko, this crazy killer cult that spread um, poison nerve gas on the subways in 1995. They had a, they built a giant microwave and they literally. Um, fried someone to death, left nothing behind. Wow. Too much. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. But I'm going to kind of segue into the podcast you're doing about people disappearing. Like, <laughs> So, um, you know, in, I think even before the pandemic, Josh Dean over at Campside Media, who's a great guy, a really good journalist, came to me and, uh, and my best friend, Mario Yamamoto, who is an actress um, and also a writer, and said, like, hey, we would love to do this, you know, uh, something in Japan. And we realized that there are challenges because, you know, you can't subtitle a podcast. And I was thinking, yeah, that's right. You, you can't subtitle a podcast. You definitely can. You just have to put it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, 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 you know, this isn't really, I mean, I, maybe there's going to be a YouTube version, but not, not. We didn't take any video. No, but you can just put the audiogram on YouTube with subtitles. Yeah, okay, that's true. But but generally speaking, right, this is Japan. So all the, all the interviews are going to be in Japanese. Uh, and so, you know, this phenomenon of people disappearing in Japan has been brought up again and again. In a country that, you know, is so orderly, you just don't imagine that 80,000 people are reported missing every year. That seems like a high number. Um, and, 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 you know, it, of course, it's true that a lot of those people are later recovered. But it, it's also true at the same time because the Japanese police are so reluctant to do actual work. Um, and the barriers are so high as to who can report someone missing that the number is probably three times that. Um, so it's kind of a fascinating phenomenon because there's no one answer. There's all these different reasons that people go missing. And, and a lot of people um, go missing on purpose, right? They want to re restart their life. And this being Japan, there are manuals that will tell you how to do it. You know, um, uh, here, here, here's a, here's a pop quiz for you. Um, you won't know the answer because it's really an unfair quiz. But um, try me. Okay, the six six things you need to identify yourself in Japan: uh, forms of identification, um, family registry, um, local registration, um, your personal seal, a registration of your personal seal, your driver's license and insurance card. Um, what is something that five of these items have in common? Easily forged. No, it's that all five of them have no photos attached. Easily forged. Yeah, yeah, easily forged. Not not so easily forged, but but um, but since there's no photo ID, it's it's hard to immediately know. You know, are yeah, you this dealing is a with forgery? It? Yeah, and that offers a wonderful opportunity to become someone else. And there are people that make uh, take advantage of that. And so, uh, you know, Josh was kind of like, "Do you think we can make a podcast out of that? Do you know anyone who vanished?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I know someone who vanished, like my accountant." You know, I paid him fourteen hundred dollars in two thousand eighteen to do my uh, my my taxes, and I paid it into his personal bank account without really thinking much about it because we were good buddies. And he vanished. He vanished with a lot of other people's money. Oh, I was about to say, I, I hope fourteen hundred isn't you need more than that to start a new life in no, Japan. I didn't need more. I think apparently it's quite a lot. And so that was the beginning of our of our of our quest. So. Um, uh, or the original person I was going to do with, Mari Yamamoto, she got this role in Pachinko, um, the Apple TV series, which which pays a lot better than than this podcast does. Not that I'm complaining. It's, we're, we know we're, we're well paid. Um, 
Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're well paid in podcasting? Yes, we're well paid in podcasting. Can I say that? I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. What the? Well paid in podcasting. <laughs> Fucking Japan. Well. <laughs> I mean, okay, compared to being a, a, um, maybe an, uh, a magazine journalist, just well paid. It's, it's a comparative, right? <laughs> well, for me, it's that. It makes sense. And so, um, Shoko, you know, had just moved back to Vermont. And she's like one of the few people I knew who had journalism experience. She was bilingual. She's, you know, she's charming. She's intelligent. I know that she's uh, secretly a hard worker. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, she just got back to Vermont, like literally the day she got back. So I'm like, I'm calculating the time and I'm like, it's probably like three in the morning or time. And I'm like, hey, Shoko, like, I know you just moved back, but there's this great podcast that Sony is going to be doing and there's, there's money for it. It's a good salary. And, you know, you'll never have an opportunity like this. I know you just moved back. Would you consider coming back to Japan and working on this thing? And to my surprise, she said yes. And then it turns out that uh, I walled. She can't really talk about all the details that her family was once on the run and like left her home state and moved to Totori Prefecture, which is kind of, you know, sort of the Vermont of Japan. Is that a way to, can I call it the Vermont of Japan? Am I, am I overstepping my boundaries? Our sister cities. Oh. So it's, it's known for cheddar and maple syrup? Precisely. <laughs> yeah, the best cheddar and maple syrup in Japan. But no, but it's it, it's a it's a famous for um, this comic book author Mizuki Shigeru, who wrote about you know uh, creatures and ghosts and demons that would make people disappear in the middle of the night. And so in this podcast, we have gone after my accountant and tried to figure out why he disappeared and um, and the circumstance surrounding his disappearance. And and you know as long, as long as you're doing, we've also followed other people who vanished and looked at the whole infrastructure that allows people to disappear as well, and some very strange cases of, of people being kidnapped, um, many of them off the coast of Niigata, but I don't want to give that away, but, you know, this is a strange country. Strange things happen here. I mean, it's very peaceful, but when people vanish, I mean, sometimes you're like, is this even real? What's the percentage of violence versus people wanting to just disappear? Um, wow. I don't think we have no conception of how much of it is violence. I just don't, we just don't think we know. I can give you, I'd say, uh, most recently, seventeen thousand of the eighty thousand people in the year who were went disappearing had had were dementia, so they wander off. Um, there was another figure that said that was the twenty twenty one figures. There was a uh, about sixteen thousand of those people are teenagers, often young girls. Um, there's a huge number of people who commit suicide. Uh, at least you know three to five thousand of those people. Um, there are other people who, who probably are professional criminals who just, you know, don't want to get caught and take an, a new identity. They get married or they get adopted and change their name so that their past crimes can't come back to haunt them. So how often of the people that do commit suicide, do people steal their identities? That I don't know. Um, it would be relatively, I think when someone, when someone, when someone commits, oh, well, if someone commits suicide and they don't have any ID uh, when they're when when they're found, it's probably pretty easy to to steal their identity. I never really thought about that. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, kill themselves and, and have nothing on them. So we talk to people who work at hotels, um, and you know, sadly, it's very common for it's it's unusually common for people. We know you all hear about the suicide forest, right? I mean, that's far. It's a pain in the ass to go to. Um, but hotels here don't ask for ID, so if you really want to bump yourself off, not that I recommend it, um, you can check into a hotel and just sign your name and, and, and write down a phone number, and there's no checks. And, and Is that still the case? Because for foreign nationals, you have to present a passport now. Yeah, you do, because you're a gaijin. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pre present my passport fucking twice. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to Japan, sir. <laughs> if you're Japanese. I remember we were talking to this hoteler, uh, you know, this woman who worked in the hotel business for many years. And, you know, it was almost with like mischievous glee. She was like, oh, yeah, you, of course you have to present a pass, you know, a passport and ID, but not we Japanese. I was like, well, excuse me, I had no idea. So it was, you know, kind of illuminating. Um, you know, it, it is, it is, uh, it is fascinating. And also, you know, 
Japan doesn't like to deal with things that are unpleasant. There's this saying, kusaimono nifuta, put a lid on something that smells bad. So I asked the National Police Agency, okay, every year you publish the number of people that were found, but you can I have the dates of like, let's say three years ago, 80,000, 81,000 people vanished. Can you break down to me how many of those people were found, why they vanished, where they are? And they're like, no, it doesn't work like that. And I'm like, don't you have the data? Couldn't you investigate and tell me? Like, you know, three years ago, I, you know, you had time, right? You could go back, you could match the data, and they, were, and they were basically like, we don't want to. That's awesome. That's the Japanese police. That sort of stuff is wild to me because, like, I feel like, anecdotally, whenever I encounter people in Japan, it's like, everyone else takes serious pride in everything they do. Mm. It seems that way. They take okay. You could argue they take pride in what they do, and that's and therefore they don't want to fail. So every case you take of someone who is missing, um, especially if you treat that as a as a serious what they call a special missing persons case, where you feel that they may be in danger, or they might harm themselves, or they could be in harm's way, um, and you don't clear it, that looks bad on your um, on your record, and so. It's much easier not to do something and not fail than it is to do something and possibly not succeed. That's why you know Japan has a ninety-nine percent conviction rate, right? You know, people are like that's amazing. You know, um, and, but ac that actually comes because prosecutors dump fifty percent of the cases that they get if it's not a slam dunk. And before that even gets to the prosecutors, the police are like, "Oh, the prosecutors are, might not take this case because it's not a slam dunk." So, you know. Uh, if you end up being indicted in Japan, there's a really good chance that you're probably guilty. Um, but a lot of the reasons that you, know, you have that 99% conviction rate is because people fear failure, and they would rather not take on a challenge than um, risk losing face. Speaking of the crime, with the declining birth rates, like what happens with crime? Like where is it going? Um, older people are um, committing more and more crimes, and a lot of them are committing crimes because. You're well taken care of in jail. You get like you know three meals a day, shelter, medical medical facilities. Um, there are, you know, the, the prisons are full now of old people who have to be taken care of. They're kind of turning into sort of like Japan's second retirement community. I mean, uh, so that's kind of surprising. There was a great book written a couple of years called Bolso Rojin, which was basically like you know old people out of control, which was a you know a huge book about you know how old people are involved in more and more crimes um, of all natures, in, including, you know, including sexual crimes. Because a lot of, as, as people get older, especially if they get early dementia, that filter or that sensor or that things that stops them from doing things that they know are not right sort of fades away. And, you know, that's why it's sort of like run away, out of control old people. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, in America, we just let them do it. Mm. Japan's aging society provides very strange, you know, very strange statistics like the Yakuza, right? You're, you know, you, you have the tattoos, right? I, but I don't think you have the missing fingers of the criminal history. No, no. Um, no, I get asked about it depending on what countries I enter. <laughs> you know, the average age of a Yakuza now is 51. You know, I mean, 51, I'm like 53. It's not, I'm not very intimidating. You know, some of the guys at the top of the organization are 80 years old. They're now out in Shinjuku street fighting people. Yeah, you know, just like in those Yakuza games, which are so realistic. <laughs> the ones by Sega. <laughs> well, that's why they moved the, the more recent ones back to like the 70s and 80s. Like, like, oh, hey, these guys were young then. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you know, if you if you tried to do one of those in modern, you know, in, in modern day Kabuki show would be like, you know, what would be, you know, Kidu would be like, you know, Kidu would be like, ah, oh, I gotta. I gotta go pick up some uh, my liver medicine at the pharmacy behind the Godzilla. <laughs> um, hey, you know, uh, do you know where I can get some adult diapers um, with my with my meth? <laughs> Push away past five or six Nigerian guys offering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that passed a bunch of French tourists, right? Yeah, I was my first time down. Went down to Kabuki Show because my favorite metal bar in the city's in there. I mean, can you can you imagine like the fifty year old guy picking up a bicycle and throwing it somewhere? You know <laughs> maybe maybe like a scooter. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, 
do you have any more questions to ask? Because we got to clear out of here pretty soon. Dave. Uh, we have a. I, I know that yours usually an hour long, and, and I hate to shortchange you, but I know, I know, I know. We have to, we have to get out of here. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good rapid question for you. What is the future of crime in Japan besides the elderly committing it? Uh, because there's so many cameras here. Uh, everything is monitored. Everywhere you go, there's a camera. Uh, the future of crime in Japan is that Yakuza will fade out and crime will, will almost virtually vanish because nobody has cash. Everybody has, you know, you have an ATM. Uh, you, have a, you have a credit card or you have your PASMO or you have your PayPay card. And the only way you can get money with that is if you make the person cough up their... Um, cough up their, their number that allows them to use it. So petty crime doesn't pay. Um, you know, the, the kind of crimes like street crime and uh, robbery and theft will become much less, even though a couple of weeks ago someone stole my wallet out of my, <laughs> out of my gym locker, my bougie gym club, which, which, which flew in the face of all these nice things I've been saying in Japan for years, like, you know, oh, my, I lost my wallet many times and it came back. And, and what hurt the most? What hurt the most was, you know, as I put one of those air tag things, because we learned about this while, while we were doing the podcast, right? Um, about how it's illegal now to use the air tags to track people. And I said, I didn't know you could track people. And I'm like, I'll get one and put it in my wallet. So I put it in my wallet, and I got this notice while I was on the treadmill uh, that my wallet like, was moving. And I was like, you know, rang my wallet. And then, you know, then it stopped. And so I went to look for it and, uh, uh, you know, couldn't really find it, and uh, eventually, sort of, you know, got one of the one of the guys at the desk, and we were looking around, and we tracked it to this giant, like, basket of towels. And so we went through all these wet towels, like sweaty towels, and there at the bottom was my air tag. My wallet had been taken, but they tossed the air tag in the sweaty towels. And I thought, okay, this isn't the Japan I used to know and love. Someone has stolen my wallet, and. To top it off is throwing my air tag in a bunch of sweaty towels. So that's adding insult to injury. But still, but still, I, I, mean, I am immediately canceled everything. So they can't have gotten much except for the little cash that was in there. Uh, there's not going to be a future in, uh, for criminal organizations in Japan. Um, Japan's one law away from completely outlawing them and making them unable to do business. Numbers were 80,000 in 2010. Now they're down to 12,000. So... As someone who used to cover the Yakuza, if that was my only thing I'm going to write about, I'd be out of a job. But I can't, I, can't, I can't say that I'll miss them. What about the unaffiliated people like running shakedown bars and stuff like that? Peanuts, small potatoes. They don't last long. I mean, Japan is tr tremendously efficient. And with everything, with everything going to uh, being becoming even more orderly, um, even vanishing will be very hard. There's, they're introducing a My Number card, which is... A card that is your social security number, your ID. You have to have it to get a phone. You have to have it to get an apartment. 49% of the Japanese population has it. And probably in a couple of years when they when they basically make it impossible for you to get health insurance. Japan does have national health insurance, which is great. Um, oh, rub it in. Just rub it in. I'm rubbing it in. I'm rubbing it in. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. <laughs> when I die of cancer, think of me. I will think of you. And I, and I think it's too bad that you didn't move to, to Japan, Matt. Rest in peace. <laughs> um, there's my eulogy, folks. There's your eulogy. You had the chance. You knew that there was a place where you could, you know, there's always Canada. But uh, I'm, uned I'm uneducated, sir. They don't want me either. Uh, you know, half of Japan is now blocked into this system. When the rest of it is, uh, it's, you know, it's going to be very hard to, to fence things as well because you'll have to show your My Number card, right, in order to pawn something. Um, and you know, everywhere you go, that card will track you. I mean, you know, every purchase you make, they'll know where you are. It's kind of a China model. Um, so I think the future of Japan is is bleak. Um, as a crime reporter, I'm just glad I'm like, you know, that it's, a, it's 20 years away, this is going to fade. So I can still live off the, the rema remains of a criminal empire writing about this stuff, but it, it won't last long. You don't think they'll figure out something new? Not really. I mean, don't you? I mean... I've got friends who work in the FBI, like organized crime unit, and I mean, basically, they're always hurting for something to do. I mean, how many how many countries have you know? I mean, okay, there's Mexico, but in the United States, how many like really big organized crime groups are that have influence? I mean, you know, the, the maybe they've got you know handling waste disposal or something because the world is too too secure. 
too easily monitored, too many cameras, too many ways to track people. Even did, you know, cryptocurrency has become quite trackable. Um, everyone thought that Bitcoin was like, you know, untraceable, and it turns out to be the most traceable of all. <laughs> right. Uh, talk to Tigran Gambarian, the the blockchain wizard. You know. Anyway, before you go, I'm going to sign this copy of Tokyo Vice to you because what? because it's such an egotistical asshole thing to do. But you know, like, why not? Why not? We'll get it. You're signing it on camera, and while you're doing that, Jake. Yes. Why don't you tell the audience where they can find you? Oh, that is so nice of you. I will. I will try and. I will try and sneak in a plug for you or your show somewhere along the line, somewhere when I have a chance. Um, well, I, I hope you'll promote I, this when it comes out. I will. I will. Uh, I will. I, and, He's and, on and, camera, and, folks. And, He's and, on camera, and, fucking and, saying that. And I am sure that Sony Music Entertainment will love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the fuck did you do? Um, we're going to cease and desist from Sony, another one. Well, you know, the world is full of darkness and, 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 and things. And, you know, and this, this program, The Evaporator, is also focusing on, you know, given the choices of killing yourself or um, escaping, the escape is probably the courageous thing to do. So there is a positive message in all of this. Um, you can find The Evaporated Gone with the Gods, Kamikakushi, everywhere and anywhere you listen to your podcast, on Spotify, on Apple, on Audible. And if you really feel like listening to them anytime, all the time, go to getthebins.com or whatever that thing is and, you know, subscribe. Or can they find you personally on the socials? Oh, on the socials? You can find me on Instagram at, at Tokyo Vice, the name of my first book. You can find me um, uh, on Twitter with the difficult to find at Jake Adelstein. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe there will be some kind of Twitter feed for this thing along the way. So those, were, if you want to find me on social, that's where you can find me. Please don't find me on Facebook because I will ignore you. <laughs> wow, Jake will just ignore you on Facebook. I will. I have. I have. A, it's like I have too many friends. <laughs> oh my God, Jake has too many friends, folks. Too many friends on Facebook. It's like, please don't friend me. I, I can't handle any more friends. He's too popular for you. Do not look know, him up just, on Facebook. It's just, it's just such a pain in the ass to deal with that stuff. I understand, Mr. Popularity. Thank you for taking your time, <laughs> bringing me to your fancy social club to do this podcast. I did give you the finest booze. I, I killed it. I killed it. <laughs> and as always, you can find me at Matt underscore Slayer on Twitter, Matt Slayer on Instagram, Matt F and Slayer on Facebook, because I will respond to my fan Facebook page, twitch.tv slash Matt F and Slayer, the Patreon, home to the exclusive content. And the uncensored content, sorry, no nudity in this one, folks, at patreon.com slash Matt Slayer. Well, we're supposed to have nudity on this one? Do you it want me to just hold up the magazine again? <laughs> it could happen. I, I, I don't think Sony's going to appreciate you getting naked for me, Jake. Yeah, I guess that's true. I don't think anyone would appreciate that. Um, I, I appreciate the scoop. I don't care about the male thank form. You, thank you for having us on your show. My pleasure. So my pleasure. pleasure. And you can always find the podcast. At, and now we drink on Twitter. And now we drink underscore on Instagram. And until next week. Drink up, motherfuckers. Come by. <laughs>